Hi, this is Kendrick Johnson with TheMedSchool.com. Today we're going to be talking about diabetes. We're going to cover both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but uh, type 2 will probably be the focus of this uh, video. And it's going to be focused on information that's most relevant to uh, medical students in their clinical years and uh, other people trying to learn clinical medicine. So why is this an important topic? There's about 285 million people with diabetes in the world, um, and uh, most of those are type 2. About 90% are type 2. And it's not a fun disease to have. There's uh, a lot of complications associated with diabetes, and uh, many of these complications contribute to some of the biggest killers uh, that we have in medicine. So heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, blindness, Infections, neuropathy, and amputations are all some of the serious complications of diabetes. Um, I included this uh, diagram of uh, the guy with all the uh, diabetes complications here to the right, mostly just because I spent a long time making that uh, a couple years ago, and so I thought I'd throw it in here. So uh, the pathology of diabetes is not real well understood. But uh, as you know, it's, it's called diabetes mellitus, and it is uh, called mellitus because of the uh, increased blood sugar. And that can be due to um, either insulin resistance or insulin deficiency. And genetics and lifestyle play a big role in type 1 diabetes, or type 2 diabetes, sorry, and uh, uh, autoimmune disease is the biggest factor in uh, type 1 diabetes. So in either case, we are impairing the, either the action or the production of insulin. And insulin is the, is the uh, enzyme or the uh, uh, protein that tells the cells to uh, take in glucose. So if it's not working, then the glucose is not being taken into the cells. Um, you also uh, get inappropriate insulin release in diabetes, which means uh, we are um, just the whole, the pancreas is not functioning properly. So the high blood sugar has complications of its own um, it leads to hypertension and um, the production of what we call advanced glycosylation products. So glycosylation is the addition of a sugar to a protein in most cases. And a lot of these glycosylation products or advanced glycosylation products can't be broken down. And so they deposit uh, often in the endothelium and in other spots where they're not supposed to be and they can cause inflammation as well as uh, just obstruction. And uh, so th these are the things that contribute to the main complications that we'll talk about in a second. So type 1 we classically think of as being the childhood diabetes. It can happen at any time during life and it can be caused or uh, can have uh, be initiated by, by different factors but uh, most often you're going to see it in children. And these kids, um, if we catch them early, we're going to see them with the, uh, polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. They're going to um, have some weight loss, and some of them are going to uh, be coming in with DKA, which we, we hope we can avoid. So DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, is a condition. I won't talk about the uh, pathology here because we'll probably do another video just on DKA at some point. But uh, these uh, kids often uh, come in with Kussmaul respiration, which is these long, slow, uh, deep breaths. Um, they have abdominal pain. Uh, they're dehydrated. They have an anion, anion gut uh, acidosis. Um, in labs, we're going to see ketones, we're going to see uh, lots of potassium, 
and we're going to see our hyperglycemia. Sometimes these numbers are in the seven, eight hundreds, even the thousands. And uh, mucor sinusitis, I don't know a lot about, but this is a potentially life-threatening condition that uh, is often associated with DKA. So the type 2s we're going to see uh, differently. Um, these are, people are going to come in um, with uh, an adult onset. Often they have a family history of type 2 diabetes. And they're going to have th that same uh, polyuria, polydipsia, uh, uh, poly... Uh, what was the other one? <laughs> Um, anyway, they're going to be dehydrated. Um, they're going to be drinking a lot and peeing a lot. And um, in some of the cases, as, as uh, type 2 um, is begun, they are going to have some weight loss and uh, fatigue, infections, and then the vascular disease. A lot of these will probably probably uh, catch before we see the vac vascular disease, but these people can have stroke, coronary artery disease, uh, nephritis, retin retinopathy, um, and also uh, neuropathy is a big symptom of type 2. So I mentioned that hopefully we're going to catch these people in screening. Um, screening uh, is has been a little bit debated on whether or not it's cost effective, but uh, the the main uh, powers that be, like the ADA, um, are recommending screening for anybody with uh, two risk factors. So these are people over 45, overweight, uh, sedentary, um, of uh, ethnic groups, especially uh, Native Americans and African Americans. Um, and uh, Latin Americans. If you have a history of gestational diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome, those are all risk factors for, uh, for type 2 diabetes. I left out hypertension and a couple others. So this is a huge chunk of the population. Um, I mean, if just people overweight alone, that's a, that's a good more than a third of the population and, and rising and sedentary lifestyle, you add that to it and and you've got uh, most of your patients are probably going to uh, meet the two risk factors for screening for for uh, diabetes. So, so the diagnosis is made by any random glucose over 200 or uh, two fasting glucose is over 125. So a lot of times you'll just be ordering like the complete metabolic panel that includes uh, uh, fasting glucose. And if you see one of these over 100, then you might run uh, either the two-hour glucose tolerance test or the um, or you'll do uh, an A1C. This is kind of a new one, new thing. The hemoglobin A1C over 66.5 was just accepted in 2009 as an acceptable uh, screening tool and diagnostic tool for type 2 diabetes. So this is an important thing to do so we can start treatment and prevent some of the bad things that happen with diabetes. So... In type 2 diabetes, there's a huge lifestyle component that's uh, going to have a major effect on the progression of the disease. Much of type 2 diabetes can be uh, avoided um, or at least controlled uh, with non-pharmacological lifestyle type changes. So uh, a healthy diet, exercise... Um, in some cases, uh, bariatric surgery might be warranted if, if people are unable to lose weight otherwise. But the official recommendations are today um, to start metformin along with the lifestyle changes as a first-line therapy. So even though uh, a lot of people probably could be managed by lifestyle uh, changes, 
Um, I think the m- my theory is that the reality of it is that a lot of people just aren't uh, aren't uh, changing their lifestyle, whether it be you know their own lack of willpower or the fact that uh, their doctor doesn't have enough time to to help them with it. But uh, either way, a lot of these people are not getting controlled just by lifestyle changes. Uh, so um, with a new di- uh, diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, the recommendation is to start metformin along with uh, dietary exercise counseling. So that's your first line. Um, you're going to follow up in a few months. And if you uh, are not able to get uh, their hemoglobin A1C under 7, then you're going to be adding another agent. So a lot of times you're going to be adding glipizide or glipuride, one of the sulfonylureas. These act by increasing insulin secretion. Um, you also got uh, your pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, um, your, which are your thiazoline dions, and they increase the sensitivity of the cells to insulin. So if if none of these or a combination of all these are not giving you the control that you need then uh, you're going to have to use insulin. This uh, You might have to use insulin also in cases where uh, people are just not um, very compliant with their medications as well. Um, or, of course, if it's a type 1 patient, then we skip over the um, metformin, sulfonylureas, etc., and go straight to the insulin because... Uh, those others are dependent on having some insulin secretion or some insulin uh, effectiveness. So ACE inhibitors are also important not for uh, controlling the blood sugar but for controlling some of the adverse effects of the hyperglycemia. Mainly, or most importantly, they are there to protect your kidneys. There's uh, some debate over how these exactly protect your kidneys, but it's uh, understood that they prevent remodeling of the kidneys and uh, and therefore prevent uh, kidney failure. So going back to type 1, sorry that this is kind of crammed in here like this, but... Uh, to type 1 with your DKA treatment. And by the way, you can have DKAs with type 2 as well, but uh, it's much more common in type 1. So if a patient comes in with DKA, the major treatment is fluids. That's the biggest thing that has to be done is to get uh, fluids in there. Um, Potassium and insulin and potentially glucose. Now the glucose probably sounds like it's a little bit counterintuitive, uh, especially if you're adding insulin and glucose at the same time. But the insulin that we're giving is actually not to decrease the blood sugar, but to prevent uh, ketogenesis. So the glucose is given at the same time as the insulin uh, to keep blood sugars normal once we once they are normal, and uh, and then the insulin is there to prevent uh, further ketone production. So back to type 2, well, mainly type 2, I guess it, this could apply to both. We, we want to prevent the complications of diabetes. And so with a, a regular diabetic... Um, checkup, you want to have an eye exam, a foot exam, uh, you want to do a microalbumin screen, and uh, and address coronary artery disease. So the eye exam, I'm not going to go over here because I personally am probably just going to send them to an ophthalmologist every year. They need a a dilated eye exam, and I, I probably won't do that in a primary care setting. But the foot exam you'll do probably in a a primary care setting. So you want to look at the foot, make sure there's no ulcers and calluses. 
you know, talk to them about the history of claudication, check their pulses, do an ABI, um, ankle brachial index, to uh, check for vascular disease. Um, the monofilament test, I just figured out recently that I've, I've been doing it wrong. These are the points that I've got here on the on the kind of strange foot picture. It looks like whoever took this picture is probably taking it of their own foot. So if anybody wants to take a really nice picture of their foot and send it to me, then I'll, I'll use that one instead. But uh, these points here, uh, one on the big toe, one on the little toe, uh, three uh, across the uh, ball of the foot, and then one on the heel. Those are the points that you want to check with your monofilament. Um, and then to diagnose uh, neuropathy, you use uh, monofilament plus vibration or plus uh, some other uh, sensory test. You want to talk to them about their feet care. Uh, they need to wear shoes and test their water temperature, trim their nails, uh, keep, keep them clean. And uh, also you want to do a, a micro, microalbumin or urea screen. Uh, so get that urine sample and make sure they're on the ACE inhibitors. And just uh, watch, their, watch their A1C levels really carefully. Um, so if uh, the coronary artery disease screen, this is one that... Uh, a lot of doctors are just doing with with any of their diabetic patients. The official recommendations are that you want to uh, do a screen for a, any sedentary diabetic who's planning on starting a new exercise uh, plan. So, so these people need to get uh, um, a stress test. And then with all of them, you want to talk about the risk factors. So. Obesity and hypertension, those are all part of the metabolic syndrome um, that leads to coronary artery disease. I keep, the, keep their hypertension under control. Watch their lipids. Most of these you want to keep uh, under, under 100 um, on their LDL levels. You can do that with uh, lifestyle and, and statins mainly. Get them to stop smoking. I can't remember why this asterisk is here um, on the smoking, but I I, I think it uh, I think it is um, I don't know maybe it was just important. <laughs> I can't remember why I put it there. Um, aspirin uh, has a little bit of a question mark by it, uh, but most people are still recommending aspirin. Metformin. Um, has some anti-inflammatory properties also that that are shown to help with coronary artery disease, um, exercise, and then just uh, again the glycemic control. These are the risk factors that I just talked about. I meant to take this slide out, and uh, these are where the artwork comes from uh, for this uh, video. Please send me your comments. Um, on uh, what you think I can do better here, uh, imp important information that I've left out, or um, information that I got wrong. Again, it's Kendrick with themedschool.com. You can email me at Kendrick uh, at themedschool.com, or you can leave a comment below. Thanks.